Great is the Lord, he is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true. By his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice. Now lift up your voice. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true. By his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice. Now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord. I lift up my voice. I lift up my voice. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Letting go of every single dream, I lay each down down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering never changes what you see. I try to win this world, I confess. My hands are weary, I need your rest. Mighty warrior, king of the fight. No matter what I face, you're by my side. When you don't move up mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Truth is you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So in all things be my life and breath. I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. You are my strength and comfort. You are my steady hand. You are my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand Your ways are always higher Your plans are always good There's not a place where I'll go You're not already stood 
you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you.
forget who it was it was in another context this past week that said that the broken places are how the light gets in the broken places in our lives are often what bring us to the Lord they they make us aware of our needs but then the broken places in our lives are also how the light gets out the reality of God's work in our broken places. It is it's true. We live as broken people. And it's his activity that both comes in and wants to shine out. So you bring them. You bring those places. <laughs> you bring that reality to him. And he works. 
in his way. Heavenly Father, you know the realities of our lives today, whether there is places of stubborn resistance or there's places of incredible need and pain that need your healing touch. Or perhaps before us is an amazing opportunity that you set forth to demonstrate that you are at work. Lord, if we could see, if we can see, if we, Lord, we don't often see. But this morning we choose to trust that both of those things are true. That you're at work in our painful places that you're demonstrating your work in our brokenness and that you're setting before us an amazing opportunity. Lord Jesus, again, it's your hand at work among us. We realize that we live in a world where that is true too, that we live in a very broken world. And in the midst of all of the pain in our world today, we ask for your work, your comfort, your strength, your, your name to be lifted up in our broken world. We know that the circumstances of life cause us to recognize that we are not in control. But we look to you as the one who knows and who finds in those circumstances, a way to bring honor and glory to yourself. So, Father, thank you. Thank you in the midst of the realities of our lives. That you're at work. That you are demonstrating your goodness and your grace and your call and invitation to our world. Not only to our hearts, but to the hearts of those around us. Would, would you draw them, Father? Would you draw us closer? Draw them nearer to who you are and to your work. Father, we do pray. As your people for the world around us. For our nation in need of your comfort in the midst of really trying and difficult times. For wisdom for those who are making decisions that affect our whole country for our president and for those who work with him and share those responsibilities within the halls of government from our local level through the national level. Lord, they carry responsibility from you and accountability to you. And so we pray for them. We pray your wisdom for them. We would ask for those uh, who carry those responsibilities to be able to hear clearly from you. Father, our world today, whether that's in really difficult places where your children are, are hunted or find themselves displaced in refugee camps, Lord, we would pray even in those places that our brothers and sisters can be good witnesses to you that they can experience a new part of your heart, a new way of your provision in those difficult places today. For, Father, we recognize that from you and for you and to you are all things. So in our place today, we bow before you. And Lord, we come and we present to you our tithes and offerings representing who we are and our recognition that everything has come from you and we want to be good stewards for you of the good things you've entrusted to us. So Lord, we present these gifts to you and ask for your blessing on each gift and each giver in your name. Amen. Ushers, would you come receive the morning offering at this time? So you've probably heard stories like this at other times about a man who buys a car that has a voice warning system, right? You might have one yourself. At first, he was just a little amused to find her voice reminding him that his seatbelt wasn't fastened, and he began to call that little voice in his dash, you know, the little woman, right? The little woman riding along with him, and he soon discovers that his little woman was pro programmed to warn him about his gasoline 
your fuel level is low, she would say in her own sweet voice, and he would nod his head and thank her, but a few minutes later, her voice interrupted again with the same warning, your fuel level is low. And so it went over and over, and although he knew it was the same, he began to find it just a little more irritating each time. So finally he stops the car and he looks under the dash and he finds the speaker and he pulls the little wire off of the speakers. So much for the little woman, right? And he was congratulating himself when a few miles down the road his car runs out of gas. And somewhere inside the dash he was sure he could hear the little woman laughing. God's word can sometimes function like that in our lives. We can hear the Lord speaking, and yet we, we realize it's not really what we want to do. We don't want to respond. We don't want to listen. And we choose to ignore or even disconnect from it. But the reality is it's telling you just what you need to know. In the first chapter of James, we've kind of been working our way through that book. We come to this passage of Scripture where it talks about that process of God's Word showing us what we need to know, telling us what we need to hear. So kind of our work our way up to that, the, the verse right before the passage we're going to focus on says this, that God chose to give us birth through the Word of truth, that we might be kind of our first fruits of all that He created. And this verse is talking about God speaking and his description and, and a message that we've received from him that's called the word of truth, right? Today, we encounter that word through, well, the Bible, right? Through God's written word. And when James is writing to them, of course, you know that they didn't have their Bible. But what they had was a description, a body of teaching, the, the stories of Jesus, the person of who he was and what he has done for them. And James is writing to a group of people much like us who have come to that place where they embrace who Jesus was, but the challenge of responding to his work in their daily lives continued, right? The challenge of facing the reality of what their life is like, who they're like, and responding to the continuing word of God to allow it to do its continuing work. It says here that we might be a kind of first fruits, right? That his word might bear its fruit in our hearts and lives first, that we can experience that ongoing activity of the Holy Spirit to correct, to shape, to direct, well, for us to grow, right? In, in every part of our hearts and lives, the first fruits, right, of his work being productive in us. Okay, kind of with that as the foundation, right? As people who God's, are experiencing God's continuing work, let me just read for you our text for this morning. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the words and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word and doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. And those who consider themselves righteous and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Hmm. So James goes on to say that that word implanted in you has an ongoing purpose for you, a purpose that invites you to get engaged with God's continuing work and its impact that he intends for each one of us. 
It's the way God uses his word to help us see ourselves and enables us to go. So two simple parts, right? Two simple parts that won't be new to most of you are simply this, that God expects us to be hearing and doing what he has for us. Simple to say, I know. But really describes the challenge of God's work in our hearts and lives from this day forward, from the time we first receive it as God's word for us to the challenges of living it out each day. First part of that, right? Hearing, hearing God's word. How, how do you receive God's word? Does it penetrate in? Does it find those places in our hearts where there really is a, a new sense of God speaking to us? Really, this idea of hearing, right, is foundational. Listening is, is foundational to the relationships that we have in every sense of the word, right? It talks about this as everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I'm sure you've heard maybe that in terms of your human relationships, how important it is to be twice the listener, it is to be the speaker. But in this context, it's talking about your relationship to the Lord. It's saying, look, recognize first of all that what God has to say is to be first received for you. It's there for you. Don't be so quick to begin to tell it to someone else. You're just like me in lots of contexts. It's easy to hear something and think, oh, I wish they would get this. And recognize that first we need to be hearers and not just speakers of the truth. When you think about listening and how important it is, I don't want to gloss over the fact that it's a challenge to be a listener. Really, listening is difficult, right? It's difficult in, in lots of ways. I have this personally illustrated. You might not know it. I think most of you do, is that over the years, I've gone kind of partially deaf, right? I, I've lost maybe what looks like 20% of my hearing. The top 20% of the sounds that I used to be able to hear, I can no longer hear without help. And uh, we can be like that. We can slowly lose our sensitivity to God's voice. God's voice is meant to be taken personally. And you can hear it so often, and you can hear it said so long that your mind just slips into these familiar tracks, right? Okay, I know what that says. And it just kind of sits down into kind of a little calloused place in our mind, and we don't really hear it for ourselves. We don't really engage with what God is saying. Listening can be difficult. It's interesting that he says we should be quick to listen and slow to speak. He doesn't say we should never speak. Right? He's not saying don't speak. He's saying Make sure you're listening first. Listening can be difficult, right? And really, when you think about it, listening is very important. Jesus had given all these parables, and at the end of a parable, he will often say something like this. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Right? Jesus is saying, listen, listen carefully, Engage your minds. What I'm trying to tell you is important. Hear what I'm saying. In, in some ways, we can think about listening as an act of love. And in, in your relationships to other people, to listen to the person around you, to listen to the next person, that is often indistinguishable in their mind from being loved. That listening and loving are almost the exact same thing. In fact, you can't love someone else if you're not willing to at least listen to them. That's what, what uh, James is saying. He writes to them and says, dear brothers and sisters, he loves them, right? He wants them to hear him. He's speaking to them in this moment. He wants them to hear. He wants them to receive what he's saying with the love he is expressing. Hmm. Maybe that's why when God speaks and his word is engaged, the, the psalmist would say things like this, joyful are the people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. They've listened. Do you get it? They have listened. They've heard 
God's word the way God intended it to be. And they receive it as an act of, of love. Hmm. Listening is foundational to our relationship with God. Hearing his word, receiving it as God intends it. But listening is not only foundational to the relationship, but it requires kind of the same kind of commitment as any relationship does. It's, it's not just what we hear, but how we hear it. You remember the parable of the sowers, right? There were all these different kinds of ground, the same seed. The Word of God is sown into all these different kinds of soils, representing different kinds of hearts. But the foundation comes, right? The, the, the bottom line is the seed on good soil. It's only the seed on the good soil that bears its fruit. And that seed stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. We forget the persevering part, right? The kind of commitment that it takes to respond in simple ways on a daily basis. It's not just one response. It is a heart of response. It's a commitment to respond. That's why Paul would be so thankful for the people in the church in Thessalonica. And he said this, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. They brought it in, not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. That, work is, that word is at work, right? When you think about that kind of commitment, right? It just, it's a new perspective on how you hear God speak, right? You see God's word as life-giving. Right, uh, Peter would say that it is a living and enduring word of God. Uh, again, the psalmist in the New Living Translation would say this, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Do you see God's word that way? Do you recognize it really wants to shape your life and it wants to bring life into your circumstances? It's a life giving perspective, kind of a commitment that says, look, I am going to trust this word to be at the foundation of my life. It's a life-giving and, of course, life-shaping word. Paul would write to one of his young ministers in training, describing kind of the activities of God's word and how it's useful in all sorts of different ways. And he would say this, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. My little story at the beginning talked about kind of God's word as a warning light, but it's not just a warning light. It's also, well, a, a, a GPS map and a, a fitness monitor, right? It does all of those kind of functions to make things work the way God intends. You got to be eager to hear, to be equipped for every good work. I, I've been through those times where you read God's word and you tend to resent it. You begin to say, you're meddling in my life, right? I want things my own way. I want my circumstances to be shaped the way I envisioned them. All of those kind of things. And we can resent what God's word says. Or we can resist what it says when we know what it says, how it describes the life that God wants us to live, all those kind of things. It's not always pleasant to sit under God's word, to listen to what he says, to come to it again. Sometimes you can have it open in front of you and the words can feel like, well, maybe sandpaper to your soul. But God's promise is that they are useful. That it's there to do that shaping work, and sometimes that is the key. It isn't always easy. It's not always enjoyable. It's not always pleasant, but it's always productive. That's the promise of God's word. Then there in James, it says this, Therefore, since God's word is so important, we need to get rid of all of that moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept 
the word planted in you, which can save you. Humbly say, all right, I surrender. I know you know what's best for me. The, in the message version, it takes this verse and it uses these words to express it. It says, throw out all spoiled virtue and cancerous evil in the garbage. Why? Why would we do that, right? Why, do we, why does he encourage us to do things? We go, oh yeah, I know that. Because those things, those things that we know, that we can identify in our hearts already, until we deal with them, until we surrender them, or confess those things that are sin, until we say yes to those things he's guiding us forward in, then his word stops speaking. It stops making the impact. It stops shaping our lives because we already know what we're supposed to do. Hmm. Other places take this very same kind of approach to God's word. First Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind, like newborn babes. Crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Hmm. Do you see the connection between your desires and your willingness to respond and be shaped by God's word? That was the example, right? That's the good example of what this looks like. Paul, in his travels, was preaching in different cities across Asia Minor, and he comes to uh, the time in, in Greece, and he encounters a group of people in the city of Berea, right? And reports what he found in that place. He says, now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness, and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. To see it, they were hearing, weren't they? They were listening. They, they were having their perspective on life shaped. And they were encountering Jesus because they gave scripture and God's word its rightful place. It's a great attitude toward what God has said, toward eagerness, a willingness, right? To begin by facing the reality about ourselves, beginning with hearing God's word. But certainly... That also involves a commitment to receive what he has given, right? Don't be just hearers of God's word, but be doers also, right? Second part is doing the will of God as we understand it, as he exposes it to us. That's that verse. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Remember the Last Supper. Jesus gathers for his final meal, and as they're gathering up together, Jesus looks at them and has this huge moment where he demonstrates the kind of attitude they ought to have to each other. He takes off his outer clothes, he wraps a towel around him, and he goes around, and he takes a basin of water, and he washes all of his disciples' feet. He takes this role of a servant, and he teaches them. He says, hey, look. No servant is greater than our master. I have done this for you. You ought to do it for each other. And he gives kind of this bottom line to that example. He says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Do you get it? It is putting them into action finally where that work of God is complete in us. Where we fill up what God's spirit has begun and it becomes expressed in our, in our actions. And Jesus calls them to do what he has demonstrated. And James gives kind of that same illustration of the exposure of what's real about us and the actions that responded to it in kind of this picture that James writes. He says, now anyone who listens to the word and doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So there is a practical response 
to God's word and to his will. It's not always do or don't do. Sometimes it is see God in a new light, a new insight into his character. Sometimes it's a new passion that he births that sets your direction of life slowly shifting. It's a practical response to God's truth. Remember that a mirror is not a comb or a washcloth, right? The mirror is there to show you how to use the comb and the washcloth. We've mentioned those kind of ways in which we often experience God's Word, right? Whether that's conviction that brings us to confession and repentance or a, a new a new t- way of discipline and submission to God's will or a new activity that becomes a priority for us. So this past week, I'm sitting at my desk, and all of a sudden, this little black spider comes crawling out of somewhere, crawls across my uh, notepad, and now next to the, the, um, the phone, it's kind of just kind of sitting there and and uh, so I think, oh, that's, that's kind of fun. I wonder if I can herd the little spider around a little bit. And so I, I reach out of there with my fork that was sitting there, and I give a little thing, and slowly the spider kind of moves back, and I'm kind of having fun with the spider. And all of a sudden, he jumps. I have no idea where this spider has gone. It's so quick, so fast. I, I missed my chance with that spider. Okay. In God's speaking voice, there comes an opportunity. And we don't always know when that opportunity is going to end and when it will have be an opportunity missed. Really, unresponsiveness can be more damaging than we know. And obedience can be more healthy then we realize. Because you and I in the moment don't really, aren't capable. We, we are not seeing the whole picture. But responsiveness or unresponsiveness is a very serious issue before God's word. To do God's will, to make a practical response. Jesus, Jesus ta- comes to this often in his stories. And n- nowhere is it... Uh, greater than the story of the man that built his house on the sand and the man that built his house on the rock. Remember that? The storms come and the waves lash and the wind blows. And Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on a rock. It's the practicing that brings stability. It's the responsiveness that enables us to survive those times. It is the practical application of what God is seeking to do. And James gives the two really practical applications right in this context, right? He says that it's even reflected in how we speak to one another. He says those who consider themselves religious and do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't affect a controlling part of how you speak to other people, then something's wrong in the process of God's work in your heart. If it's not affecting what comes out of your mouth. We'll, we'll return in the story of James, in the letter of James to how we talk later on. He, he goes into great depth about how important it is, what it says about us, what comes out of our mouth comes from our hearts, and it becomes for us a gauge, a gauge of how responsive we are. It's not just reflected in how we talk. It's expressed in our care for the helpless people around us, right? James says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress. It's a practical kind of application, and yes, he comes back to how we treat other people. It's an incredible, important part of our responsiveness to God. It expands it in just the next chapter as he talks about favoring the rich and kind of looking over the poor. Doing God's will involves a practical response. It's, but it's not just about a response, right? It's about a persevering challenge. It's about 
taking that response and taking steps that say yes to the Lord in a daily kinds of ways. He uses those kind of phrases and continues in it, doing it, and it's that which makes God's blessing realized in our hearts and lives. Don't give up. Okay. <laughs> That's why we gather together on these weekly basis to encourage one another to say, hang in there. Right? And in this context, in James's context, it is this commitment to God's purifying work. He says, keep yourself from being polluted by the world. We live in the world, but we don't base our life on the world's resources. We don't love the world or the things of this world. Our hearts and lives are shaped by a love for God, by his work in the midst of this world. It's persevering, right? It, saying yes to God, obedience. Saying yes, okay, I will be obedient to your guidance. Those things do two amazing things for us. First, our obedient response reflects God's holiness. Can you see it? When you say yes to God, you're going the way he wants you to. You're living life the way he asks of you. His commands come to shape us. And they re reflect on who he is. We're, we're his people. Remember I said the cracks in our lives sometimes let his life out, right? When we begin to deal with those things. I am kind of started maybe with some of you, kind of my Bible reading through the Old Testament, you know, and so I read a little bit from the Old Testament, New Testament, you know, hoping that maybe by the end of the year I will have completed them both, you know, as we work through this year. This year. Maybe you're doing that. And if you're about where I am, you're in Leviticus, right? And uh, often in Leviticus, God gives all of these different commands, right? They're supposed to do this or not do this, and they celebrate this and this, and he often says this, because I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I'm holy. Be a reflection of how I interpret you to live. And part of this holiness is a, a decision daily to say yes to God, to let him shape our lives in the, the worship of the temple. Even the priestly garments that the priests wore were there to teach them about who God was. And there was nothing more significant about these garments than the high priest's turban. And the high priest had all these special vestments, and they had this ephod that has these stones on it representing people, and they had all these things on their shoulders. But on the turban, there was this pure gold plate that was attached to the front of the turban. And on it was engraved these words, Holy to the Lord. Today, each one of God's people is entrusted with the responsibility and privilege of serving as a priest. You take that place in all of the aspects of the priestly ministry in the Old Testament. The, the believers today find themselves with those same responsibilities, with the same calling on their lives, to have that same thing blazed on their forehead. Holy to the Lord. And there is no holiness without obedience. The, the saving work of the world word continues, right? One brings us into the family and one teaches us how to respond. One, one calls us his own and one directs what we look like. It's, it's a challenge that goes on every day for you and for me. To reflect God's holiness as we live in obedience. And as we do that, somehow God's design is complete in us. Obedience results in God's design. 
tells us that the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, right? he's the man that's shaped, that's freed, that's living the life as God designed it to be lived. To the Ephesians church, Paul said this. He said, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us to do long ago. And the things that God has planned for you begin with what he has described life to be like for you. And it's expressed in an obedient heart before him. A practical kind of persistent doing. A, a, a willingness to face the reality of what God has said and how we're to live. To look into that mirror of God's word. And to take that image that God wants to work with. To trust his word to follow his will, to be his people. Obedience, right? Reflecting God's holiness, resulting in God's design for your life. He knows, he knows how to work. And he is at work in each heart that belongs to him. The psalmist finally would say this, blessed. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, whose walk who walk according to the law of the Lord. You might recall that Psalm 19 is all about God's word. It uses all these different terms to describe it. It talks about God's word, God's law, God's decrees, God's statutes, not statues, statutes, right? His precepts, those, those principles on which life operates. And all through the psalm, there is a sense in which it is good. It's good. It is good for you. And it's good for those around you to be people shaped by his word. How are you doing? How has the reality of God's work been experienced in your heart in this past week? Beyond that, what do you want? What do you want? Do you want to hear God speak? then you're going to find yourself in his word. You're going to expose your heart to what can be the uncomfortable process of seeing the reality that God wants to show you about yourself. But in it, in it there's life. In it there's help. In it there's hope. In it there is a sense in which God's hand can work. I encourage you to find yourself in communion with God through his word and face the reality of what he's about with a sense of expectancy. So Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness, for your invitation to come and encounter your work in new ways. You are a good and awesome God, and your plan and your work is good. <sighs> Lord, would you expose us? Would you again show us ourselves? Invite our obedience again today. We trust it to be good. We know your hand and invite its free work. Let me just give you a moment to respond. Maybe it's been a while since you heard that voice of the Lord. Since you encountered it and you might, be, you might know right now what has been the problem. Maybe you just need a quiet minute to finally come to grips with what God has been saying and to yield to it. Or maybe you're ready to take the next step to say yes 
Lord, I will. Lord, would you help us to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also. In your name I ask it. Amen. Amen. Again, in your pew racks are those information cards. If there's a way I can be an encouragement to you, if you would love to just spend some time talking about God's voice and what he's been saying to you, you could take a a card, an information card, and just note your name and a way to get a hold of you and hand it to me as we're dismissed. And I'd love to spend up a time to, together just to look to the Lord and to face the realities that he's about among us. Because it is to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. To him that is at work within us be all glory be all glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. May you go in peace. <laughs>